Lively crowd you all are. Thank you for coming this evening to the MIT Enterprise Forum of Cambridge. We are delighted to have you here. Um, as you are probably aware, if you have come to an uh, Enterprise Forum event in the past, the Enterprise Forum exists to provide a variety of different kinds of information and content and connection opportunities and services to the entrepreneurial community, specifically the tech entrepreneurial community, um, whether or not you're a member of the MIT community. Um, we have a very full calendar, something more than 70 events per year. Um, for all sorts of subject area interests and um, practice interests for startups, for CEOs, for investors, you name it. Um, the full calendar is available on our website, but I'd like to point out to you that although the school year may be drawing to a close, the calendar continues to be populated with interesting and, and high content events, both for the special interest groups and also for our startup clinic. We have our next startup clinic event on the 6th of June, and it is an interactive event. Audience participation is a big part of it, so please come take part. Um, have some uh, great conversations with people in the audience and with the two pitching companies, and provide your feedback to them to give them a better shot at making it to market successfully. Um, we have a tremendous breadth of interests and backgrounds, and we have phenomenal stories of people who have met and launched startups together, or um, shared resources, or made connections with and for each other through the forum. If you have a story to share, we would love to hear it, and we'd love to promote it for you. So um, please reach out to any of the folks wearing MIT Enterprise Forum badges, um, or again, contact us through the MIT Enterprise Forum website. Um, we have a tremendous, tremendous pool of volunteers and supporters who do an incredible amount of work all year long to pull together events like this. So I would like to thank all of our volunteers and supporters for their hard work. We also have a tremendous pool of members. And so let me just ask, how many of you this evening are here for the first time? Yeehaw, man. Welcome. How many of you are volunteers or supporters in other forms? Awesome. Members? Great. Sponsors? <coughs> awesome. What a great mix. See, now you all need to stick around for drinks afterwards and get to know each other. That's the idea. So thank you very much to our members. And obviously, we could not get along without our sponsors. All of our programs are supported locally by our local volunteers, members, and sponsors. So please join me in thanking our tremendous sponsors, without whose support we could not put on these programs. Specifically, uh, I'd like to thank our sponsor for this evening's event, Foley Moag and Dana. Would you please say a word? Well, I've been told that I should cut the blah, 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 so I'm going to try to keep it short and sweet. Um, as you just heard, the firm is the sponsor for the evening. We're really thrilled to have the long-standing relationship with the MIT Enterprise Forum. The firm has been a sponsor for more than 15 years, and like any good relationship, it just continues to grow and improve, and the benefits uh, for us, and we like to think for the community, increase over time. The firm is a medium-sized general practice law firm with offices in Boston, uh, Waltham, Paris, France, and Washington, D.C. And we focus on uh, technology companies and life sciences companies and assist with a whole range of legal services that those companies might need. So we'd be happy to assist any of you. Uh, we focus on uh, small entrepreneurial companies in particular and have assisted a number of companies coming out of the Enterprise Forum over the years. So I think I'll cut it off there and I'll look forward to meeting more of you afterwards in the R&D Pub. Thank you very much. So just in case you're not reading, 
Um, R&D pub afterwards, drinks on Dana. <laughs> Please come. Um, and in case you're not reading something else, we would love for you to tweet about this evening's conversation. Um, hashtag as you see it, M-I-T-E-F. Um, so uh, we couldn't be prouder and happier than to have our two guests this evening for the fireside chat. I'm going to allow Tim to introduce our guest of honor, but um, please allow me to introduce Tim Rowe, who's the founder and CEO of the Cambridge Innovation Center. Um, for those of you who are not already aware of CIC just up the street, it is one of the largest communities of entrepreneurial startups in the United States, something like 485 current um, residents and counting, and it's also been named by Boston Magazine as one of the best places to work. So it's a great place to start a company, it's a great place to um, be an employee as well. That's quite an endorsement for Tim and his team. Um, Tim is also a partner with New Atlantic Ventures, where he focuses on consumer tech uh, launches that have mass appeal, and he has also a long list of prior exploits. Um, not least of which being a lecturer here at Sloan, being a manager with the Boston Consulting Group, and a, a researcher with Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi excuse me, Research Institute. Um, we, have, uh, we have a great uh, debt to Tim to jumping in to host this evening. Um, I would invite you to talk to him afterwards, but unfortunately we're going to lose both Tim and Joey immediately after the program this evening. So um, I encourage you to tweet and follow up with them um, afterwards, remotely. <laughs> Tim, thank you so much. Thank you very much. So, uh, so much to say. Uh, First of all, uh, Joey, so for your information, since you're a bit newer to this community, you may not realize that there are a lot of faces in this crowd who often sit in these chairs. And that's a real uh, honor. I think there, it's not often at these gatherings that we see so many of our community leaders come out to meet uh, one of our speakers. Um, so thank you all for coming. Uh, it's just terrific. He's got so, uh, and I also want to do, do want to thank Coley, who I didn't ask me to say this, but uh, they are our law firm at Cambridge Innovation Center, and uh, if you've been in business for a while, you know once in a while you get into a tight spot, it's good to have the right people next to you when that happens, so thank you. So, uh, those of you who uh, came out of college and were single and in the, you know, kind of going to clubs and hanging out and so forth, probably, there was probably a moment where you were going out somewhere late at night and you, and you saw across the club, you saw the DJ and it was someone doing something amazing. Uh, performer, they had all the gear and they were, the whole place revolved around them, they were playing the right stuff, they were playing stuff you hadn't heard yet, but you knew it was going to be your favorite song. And uh, if you see such a person, you know, a few times over and over again, you start to kind of idolize them. And that was the case with me uh, in my early 20s living in Tokyo. And the DJ was Joe. <laughs> and uh, he didn't really remember this period. And he's like, okay, I've got a stalker interview. Like, like um, but uh, this guy was already, there's a, there's a kind of a, an irreality sphere around Joey. You'll, you'll come to realize if you read about him. Not so much if you meet him, because he's kind of a normal guy when you, you meet him. But then the things that you do, Joey, are just, uh, there's, something, there's something different about them. And I, I remember um, at some point uh, I read about you that, that uh, Timothy Leary um, adopted you as his grandson. Or his grandson. Uh, and I mean, that just doesn't happen to normal people, right? I mean, so, and there, there's a long series of these kinds of uh, kind of improbable events that, that surround you. So I, I think of you as kind of the improbability drive, if you will, for, for those of you you're also in a way one of the original digital natives. You're, you're one of these people that got what was going on before many of the rest of us. Uh, you founded the first internet service provider in Japan. And by the way, for those of you who are students of Fireside Chats, this is where you get to learn a little background if you haven't done your homework on, uh, on Joey. 
Uh, and that, in your company, was then acquired by PSINet, which, for those of you who recall, what, you know, they were the big leading internet service provider in the United States and probably around the world for, for a period of time. Um, you then found Infoseek Japan, uh, were involved in the U.S. arms of a number of Japanese companies. Um, and you, 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 you filled this niche, which uh, really very few shoes, people could, could fill these shoes, which uh, someone who understood the United States and understood Japan and could bridge the two, particularly a period when Japan was a, a, a kind of a, a heyday of being popular, everyone was talking about you know, Japanese business models and being like Japan. This is before the 20 year uh, uh, depression that <laughs> the country sent into. Uh, you, but you didn't stop there. You, you went on, you, you, you started being more active in the Valley, you, you moved on to being, uh, you know, showing up as the, you know, on the board of ICANN. Um, again, a, a kind of a godlike thing to do, but let's face it. ICANN is the group that, that controls the internet. They, they're in charge. They, you know, the numbers and the names of how the whole system works. Uh, you were on the board at Creative Commons, and I think uh, now lead it. You are on the board of the MacArthur Foundation. I mean, how, did you, how does one person manage to do all these things? And I'm just getting started. Right? Uh, when, uh, when the Media Lab set out to, to look for a new director, uh, all of us in the community, I think, sort of privately sat and said, well, if I were on that search committee, you know, who would I look for? And it was a really tough search. Uh, we knew Nicholas, I think many of us in the community knew Nicholas Negroponte, who had been the, the founding um, executive director of the Media Lab and a real, a real leading light. Um, we knew the history of this lab and the, the way that this lab had a kind of irreality sphere around it. And trying to think who would fill the, who, who could fill this spot properly. It was just a tough, I know that I didn't, my short list was zero names. I couldn't think of, of anyone. And then when they announced that it was you, it was like the, you know, the sunlight came out. And I said, oh my gosh, they got it so right. So now that I've sort of built you up, right? <laughs> Take, take me back to where you started. A lot of people think you must have been this sort of international, like cross-border sort of thing, but you, you grew up in Detroit, right? Yeah, and just so I don't take more credit than I deserve, just I want to fix one thing, which is the internet service provider, the first Japanese one. They started in my apartment, in actually my toilet, and <laughs> they, they, well, the pop and the office was next I was helping them along, and when PSI had acquired the company, yeah. I became the CEO. So you were the toilet owner for the first time. I was the toilet owner, <laughs> because there was a little company, it was actually the company, it was called IAKK, and it was, it was, it was funded by um, Intercom, which was a software company in the States, and, and they couldn't get a kind of office, and, and I was helping them out, but I took over once PSN. So you helped just, start. I helped start, I helped start, start. Okay. and then it was the first thing you got. But anyway. And he's humble too. Um, okay, but, but really, after you peeled all that, yeah. and then we, we had a chance to chat about this a little bit. Tell about the age of 14. You, you basically grew up in, in near, Detroit. Detroit. Yeah, near, near Detroit. It was um, sort of in Birmingham and, um, and near Southfield. And this is sort of the suburbs of Detroit. So tell, tell me just a little bit, if you will, you know, how, did that, how did that shape you? What, what, were the, what, t what did you take away from that as part of your life? It was a, it was a tough time. It was because I moved to Michigan in like 1971 and was there until about 1981. Um, and that was the worst time to be a Japanese kid in Michigan. I mean, half the kids that went to my school were unemployed, auto workers, living in trailer homes. Um, and the other half were, you know, most of the kids were somehow related to the auto industry. And this is when Japanese hadn't created any jobs in Detroit. And, so, and I was the only Japanese kid ever. <laughs> and enemy number one was... Yeah. <laughs> so there was one Japanese kid, one Jewish kid, and one black kid. And then everybody else, was, else were um, sort of... Um, uh, Automobile-related Roman Catholics. So you had two friends. <laughs> well, I, I, I only hung out with the Jewish kids, <laughs> but it was tough because you know it was literally physically tough, and um, and as also my parents were not Native Americans, they weren't they didn't understand they didn't, weren't educated in the United States, and so it was, it was it was really tough going. My first sort of until junior high school, and I thought you know and I kind of sort of tinkered around and played with you know, science and technology, but it wasn't, I wasn't really a very good student, um, it was, and I wasn't very happy back in, in, in Michigan. You know. and, and at age 14, you had the opportunity to go back to Tokyo uh, to, I guess, your mother was living there at the time, you went to, you went to high school. You yeah. went to Kent Junior High School, yeah. um, because Ed Reicher was the, the once an ambassador. He, my mother had found him and put him on the board of the company that my father was working at. And, uh, 
So, and then it's a long story, but they, they ran a, a junior high school called Ishimachi International School. I'm on the board of that now. And um, I went there, and suddenly it's this international school where it's Japanese and Americans and you know, 20%. And suddenly I went from the bottom of the pile to this Japanese kid who pretended to be a Japanese but also could be an American. So you kind of, it turns out that you, I ended up sort of on the, on the, so I was able to rebuild my self esteem and kind of um, blend into both the Japanese society and and uh, the American society. So what I what I felt was a bug when I was uh, growing up in the early years, it turned out that uh, this volume bicultural thing was a feature. For those of you who don't know, Ed, Ed and Roy Char, um, was perhaps the most famous American in, Jap in Japan, period. He, he was the ambassador to Japan, to Japan just after the war years, is that right? Yes, yeah, so he's famous. Um, it's not true, but he's famous for, this is again, getting <laughs> credit for something he didn't actually do. He's famous for having convince um, the uh, U.S. Army not to bomb Kyoto with a nuclear bomb. It turns out, I think he was in the room, but it wasn't his decision. But he was famous because he was, uh, he really understood Japan, he grew up in Japan. He was, I think, the only ambassador that I, I know that gave all of his speeches in perfect Japanese. Um, and he's extremely respected in Japan. He was, he was really interesting. So this is another part of the your reality sphere, because again, it's sort of like you, went, you flip through a history book and pick up some of the most famous people, and then they all sort of somehow end up connecting to you. Is there a, um, is there a moment during high school that you kind of think of as a defining moment for you that sort of somehow changed your outlook from that point out? Um, not necessarily about high school. It, it is interesting to know that my sister, who had roughly the same opportunity as me, um, finished college, straight-A student, you know, Harvard, Magnum, Cum Laude, Stanford, double PhD, whereas I'm a college dropout, straight B and C student, and um, the only thing that I did probably was I started more clubs in high school than anyone else, I think. <laughs> <laughs> because we had this little thing where, it was a really good system at the American school, what we did is each student got, every, I think every semester, got $20 worth of budget from Central, and it's in their little account. And if you start a club, you can go around and recruit members and take their money. <laughs> and most of the students aren't in clubs, but it turns out if you go in the lunchroom and you go around, you can collect lots of money. So I would raise money. I raised money for the science fiction book club, the underground newspaper, the, the JR club where we rode around trains, and we would just spend all the money eating and partying and stuff like that. <laughs> so, um, so that's why I ended up spending a lot of time. Maybe this was the, the insight. Was it how to make money or, or build a community somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so you alluded to this. You you graduated from high school. You kind of applied for and got into talks. Uh, again, part of this I didn't get into my time. <laughs> cycle back and forth. Um, yeah, well, you finally did. So it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Different door. Uh, and uh, and and I know you didn't enjoy that experience. Uh, and, and I think it was more than just grades. So tell me about what for you was broken about the sort of formalized process of education. And I ask this because you're now in charge of a formalized yeah. process of education. So, so, so to compare myself with my sister a little bit, because she's she was a really good student. She could see herself, imagine herself at the age of 20 or whatever age she imagined herself and said, I need to do this in an order to be that. So she was a planner. I was completely unable to plan. It was, uh, everything was, am I interested in this right now? What is it, what's in it for me right now? Does it help me with what my interest is? Uh, and she calls me an interest-driven learner. And the problem with interest-driven learners is they can't sit through and slog through something with um, the uh, promise from an authority that at some day this may be useful for you. Um, and similarly, I didn't want to gain any skills that I didn't think were useful because I was kind of stingy with my time. I just wanted to focus on stuff that I was interested in. So, so what was difficult for me in university was there were all these things that I was being told to learn that I didn't know what the application was. And, and again, it's, it's kind of like this is all my learning through failure. Once you fail or once you realize that you're in a situation and you don't know the law, and you screw up, then you study it. That was the way I used to learn. I always I fail first, learn later. Whereas my sister learned first and then not fail. And not fail. Um, <laughs> you know, it depends, I think, on your personality. And I think for me, there's this kind of um, practice before theory versus theory before practice. So, and, and I think what I would say is that there are a certain number, of, most of the people in this room are probably the type of people who get into university because they can plan, they have focus 
and they're able to just do stuff. Um, but there are tons of people who don't have that personality, but are also capable of doing some interesting things. And so at the Media Lab, I think, the media, if I, I, this is how I get away with it, I tell the students at the Media Lab, well, if I were at the Media Lab, I would have graduated. <laughs> because the, at the Media Lab, it's all interest-driven, it's, it's practice-driven, it's construction over instruction, and it's really not so much about learning as it is about, well, it's more about learning and less about education. And one of the problems I had, so at Tufts, I remember the specific class where I decided to drop out. It was when I had been, you know, I had run the computer club, I knew all my sorts by <laughs> And by, by heart. So I didn't, I didn't go to any of the classes where they were teaching sorts because I knew it. And then the quiz was, here's a set of, I don't remember, 3,000 numbers, sort them. Here's the Fortran. Okay. So I wrote a quick sort. And they gave me a zero. And I said, well, this works. And they said, no, we just taught you the bubble sort. And I said, but you didn't say bubble sort. You said sort them. And if you walk through my sort, the quick sort is less steps than the bubble sort. It doesn't matter. It's not what we were teaching you. And I said, okay, this, this, is, this is wrong, and, and that, that's, that's, it seems, but the, the, it's stupid, because if I really were a planner, I would have just sort of turned the other way and just gotten my degree. I should have, I could have stayed a little bit longer and finished, but for some reason I was an impatient child and just decided that this was working for me. So you bounced back rather really briefly to Tokyo, but then landed at the University of Chicago, if I recall correctly. Yes, yeah, so I was working in... I and then also failed. I was, yeah, I was in the lab, and, um, <laughs> and I was with uh, Helmut Fritchie, who's a wonderful physics professor, and um, I explained how I dropped out of computer science because it was just too applied and too sort of, I didn't like the way they were teaching it, and I could learn on my own. He said, well, our physics department at the University of Chicago is completely different. It's a whole lot and he convinced me how wonderful physics would be, so I did physics at the University of Chicago, and had a very similar thing where I, I'm much more, I, I'm an intuition person, and all of the wonderful physicists that I was working with at this company called Energy Conversion Devices would always explain things to me in this artistic way, like, well, you can see, see this amorphous material, see the dangling bond here, and imagine if you put your in here, it was this wonderful, so I said, okay, I want to do this in school. And then I went, and I was in a magnetism class, and somebody, one of the professors, I said, well, explain this to me intuitively. Just, just learn the formula and get the right answer. You won't understand it intuitively. And then, to me, that was... But, yeah, but the thing, again, I, I think I'm spoiled because I, everybody's had these moments, yeah. but I just couldn't, like, I just couldn't get at it. I, I couldn't stick it out. Or you, didn't, you weren't willing to devote your energy to something that you didn't understand as something feeding your interests. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and also the one other thing about the reason why I, I dropped out of <laughs> I'm sorry, just focus on why I'm dropping out, but um, the, 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 the other thing was I was disc jockey. I was a DJ in a nightclub at the time. It was the part I remember. So that was in Chicago. This was in Chicago. And this was a really weird time in Chicago because it was um, when AIDS was on the rise, it was like in the late 80s. Um, and this, the little community was the aldermen, the police, the drug dealers, the mafia, the, 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 the transvestites. All together. They, they're all working together and the kid is found, the, the, they try to help the kid, they try to help him. And they were, it was like a community, it was this really incredibly diverse working class community of people who were really working together to try to get through this. And at the same time, I'm in this, and that's at night, and then during the day, I'm going to college with these hyper-competitive, you know, really privileged kids who completely, when we were like walking together and, I, and we're walking through down, you know, downtown, they just don't see anything. And it was very kind of surreal, but this difference. And I decided that since I had grown up in a relatively privileged family, I was learning a lot more from this kind of community stuff. And I realized, because I'd been using, doing computer networking and, and been playing on the well, and I realized that community was really important and community wasn't, uh, to, uh, uh, sort of owned by the privileged, and in fact, maybe the privileged weren't as good at community as sort of working class, and, and, and so to me, that jumping into the sort of Chicago nightlife taught me a lot about how networks work, and and that's and my mom let me do that about a year before she <laughs> yeah <laughs> that isn't real. put you back to work yeah although I went to Japan and started another one. <laughs> Thank you. We're pleased with that. So it, it seems to me that you have this, you're, you almost have no boundaries, Joe. I mean, it, your interests go in every direction. As you're walking with your physics classmates, it's hard not to look at the kid, the drug addict, maybe sitting on the side of the road and think, what's going on with him? What led to that? And what's his worldview like? So you've got this sort of boundless interest. How do you balance the boundless interest with impact? 
And I ask that because I know that you're interested in impact. I, I, if you look at the things that you're doing, you're doing things, you're working with organizations, you're working with an organization called Witness uh, right now, which is about telling stories of disadvantage around the world and politically oppressed and, and oppressed in other ways, right? So you care about it. How do you balance the sort of the insatiable appetite for learning more and the discipline that might be required in the So it is, it is definitely difficult being interested in everything. Um, but what I realized was that if you, by, it's, it's really about making connections. And, and connecting people isn't simply just mashing them together. You have to understand the context that the two people are in and figure out how they connect. And there's a great paper about, that most people know about by Grant Ever about the strength of weak ties, which basically explains, says that most of your jobs and most of your mates come from networks outside of your close relationships. And it's in fact a difference that makes a difference. And, and so... Your, your LinkedIn second degree friend is not your first degree it, it, Exactly. And the fact, if you are interested, and you have to be sincerely interested before anyone really connects with you. And so being interested in everything, what happens after a while, if you do this for a while, is you suddenly have relatively deep relationships in all kinds of networks that aren't typically connected. So when you do sit down with um, somebody, you can provide a lot of value by saying, yeah, that person would be able to help you, and here's how I would talk to him, and let me connect you with that person. It's really like a connection thing, and that connection thing actually scales if you don't dive into operations. And so I had avoided, I was doing, when I was doing startups, I was very... So you don't actually do anything, then you're fine, it works. Yeah, it's, it's if you, exactly, if you can scale if the main job is to provide connections. The tricky thing now is the Media Lab is a very operational role that I've taken. It's, it's, it's quite operational, and the great thing is that the Media Lab is interested in everything. And so, 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 so before my life, before the internet, before, the, before Media Lab was, I had my finger in all kinds of things, and it was really ripping me apart, literally. I was going around the world um, twice a month, and uh, I think I went six or 700,000 miles last year, got three million miles of United alone. And, um, and, and it was just falling apart. But what I realized is there's every single thing I'm interested in, from DJ to you know human rights to you know whatever. There's somebody at the media lab who's more interested and better at it than me, and probably has a PhD in it. And so I'm able now to connect just about everything to the media lab, and somebody picks it up, and I can just focus on creating this community that's the media lab, which is something I love doing, and turning the context of the media lab into support. So now every little sort of like facilities thing that I do about tables and chairs, it feels now like I'm that I'm working on something that does this connection thing. So it's it's a it's a scaling of this interest in everything. Joe, you're married. What does your wife think about what you're doing? <laughs> well, we've been together about 18 years, so you know she understands. I think um, we talk on Skype every night. Um, we have four dogs in Japan, and her mother and her sister and her nephew live with us. So we're going to bring that whole contraption including here, the dogs. including the dogs. The family is kind of the life support system for the dogs. You can't, <laughs> you, can't, um, cause you can't take care of four dogs with one person. So. So right now I'm working on the visas. That's the hardest part to bring like in laws over. But but they'll be here in the spring and you they're, they're and somehow make Yeah, I, I think they go all the way up to your wife, but after that okay. So 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 but but they're very they're looking forward to coming here and settling down. But uh, that's you're getting off a little easy. <laughs> so you're, she's known you for eighteen years. You're somebody who's interested in everything. Um, it must be it must be tough for her to have her share you with everything. Yeah, I think in, in, in the early years, we I spent a lot of time with her. We, you know, we, we she had to travel with me before we had dogs and stuff like that. And then she started once we got the yard, we got the house, we got the dogs. She started to be, be happy being somewhat of an introvert and was like, "You go off and do your thing, and just you know, make sure that that, you know, that you're here enough." But um, but she's she's she moved to Dubai with you, I think. Well, she helped. So she's like she's in charge of houses and. <laughs> and, and design and everything like that, so she takes care of all of that. But um, but she's really a, an animal and thing person, and so she doesn't mind if I'm not like always there, as, as long as I'm there enough. But it, but here's 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 the excuse maybe. I, Japan is terrible, so it's bad because she compares herself. She's very Japanese, and she, she actually needs to learn English a little better before she goes. But most of her peers never see their husbands. 
And, and, and so I actually, you know, well right now I'm focused here, but when I was traveling around the world twice a month, I had maybe four or five real dinners with her every month. 